Marianne, I appreciate it. I'm excited to be part of this partner showcase. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes telling the audience a little bit about our class and how I developed the co-curricular service learning project. And then my teens in my classroom actually did some work last Thursday preparing their part to this live webinar. So this is an AED 150, so a gen ed class here at the University of Arizona. And it is learning to teach to learn. And so I want to just highlight how we're using Nature's Notebook to highlight the different curriculum that we're doing. And then my students will take the educator role in a moment and tell you about their projects. So it's always interesting to figure out um, why teachers end up partnering with community partners. And so for me, it's a natural alignment of things that I really love to do, and that's work with community partners like Lori and Nature's Notebook. And so I was looking, when I inherited these classes, for a practical way to engage my students and also find real-world applications to increase their meaning and motivation and give back to the community. And so we want to be sensitive to our audience. So I have freshmen to seniors in this class. I have um, students from Arizona, from different parts of the United States, and from different parts of the world. And I also have people from all different interests as far as their majors go. And so we want to make something that's very interesting and applicable to them. And we're going to find out how that happens. And first of all, um, when you form a community partnership, you have to reach out to different members of the community. And so I went to one of Lorianne's coffee walks that she basically does once a month. And that was last fall. And we just chatted and hit it off and um, decided that this might be a great win-win opportunity for my class, my students, and also Nature's Notebook. And so when you work with a community partner, of course, you want it to be a win-win situation. And so I did a little needs assessment with her and started looking at curriculum development, how I was going to infuse the project into my class. And what struck me was that I needed to stay true to my own learning and teaching philosophy, especially since this is a learn to teach to learn class. And so we wanted to look at experiential learning. And so they're experiencing the curriculum in this classroom, and then they're sharing it in the team setting, and then they're processing it through writing and speaking and doing reading comprehension, and then generalizing it out to hopefully real world connections, and then applying it immediately. And we learned from research that about 90% retention rate happens when we apply information immediately and we turn around and teach it versus about 5% in lecture. So this has proved to me that we should do more experiential learning in our classrooms, and especially in a general education setting. Along the way, I also found out that there's the Office of Student Engagement here at the University of Arizona, and there was an opportunity for us to do a non-credit engagement experience. And so I discovered what that was, applied for it, got approval, and then started to implement it. And we did get approval to do something called Citizen Scientists, and that's really goes along with what we do already in the classroom. And so students get a community partnership, community, and civic responsibility engagement credit on their transcript, which the University of Arizona is pushing the Office of Student Engagement. And we're actually going to go to the computer lab next week and start working on our blogs that has to do with this project. So everything that the students have been doing so far in this classroom is actually going toward the hours for this non-credit engagement experience. So pretty exciting. We've started to infuse that in our class. Something else that we have to do when we're looking at curriculum development, and these students in this class have actually done lesson planning and learned, out, learned about what that means and how to create lesson plans, and they've turned around and taught twice already. And so I had to figure out how do I align my expected learning outcomes with the Nature's Notebook project. And so there's lots of things for my syllabus, like we want to look at our learning through the eyes of an educator. We want to make the learning process fun. We want to look at instructional design processes. We want to apply practical teaching methods. And we also want to encourage personal and academic growth. And so our expected learning outcomes include things like students will be able to do very practical things like set goal setting and time management and learn about their own learning styles, how to be more motivated, um, and then go ahead and explore, reflect, and analyze through teamwork. And obviously, we want to get ready for positive workplace interactions. And so employers tell us that this is really important to be able to problem solve and collaborate together. So this is a picture from my students this summer. And they are setting up a new site at Manzo Elementary School about three miles from here to collect data. And so you can see they're having fun in the outdoors and working together. 
obviously reading and writing is important at the university setting, and so that's built into the class. And we're doing all of this through participating in community engagement with our service learning project, The Nature's Notebook. And so really what I tell my students is Nature's Notebook is our vehicle through which we learn to teach to learn. So we could have picked anything, how to make a desk. But we got an opportunity to be involved in phonology and collect data and teach others about phonology. And it's a really fun, exciting project. And so for example, students wear the educator hat a lot in this class. And this is some students from my spring class teaching us about the soap tree. Yoga. So again, Major's Notebook is the vehicle by which we learn to teach to learn in this class. So what does the service learning project mean for the students? They're going to tell you in a moment about their one of their team teaching lessons. But basically, we data collect in two different sites on a weekly basis. We're going to answer some really basic scientific questions through data analysis at the end of the term. And then we do some team teaching. We're getting ready to write our social media uh, posts so that Lorian can have some um, posts to use in e-newsletters and things that she distributes around the country. And then we also are helping by creating species identification pages where all the wonderful information on the Nature's Notebook website is supplemented with photos that these students are taking. So again, practical win-win ways that we can be involved in giving back to Lorianne Nature's Notebook through a service learning project that is co-curricular. So like I said last week, my students took the time to work together, collaborate, to come up with they're a little part of the live webinar, and so they're going to tell you the following, the name of their team, individually their plants for data collection, so you guys in the classroom are going to speak up so we can capture that, and then one person in their team is going to give a really brief summary of the team teaching lesson they did recently, and then individually they're going to share what I've learned statements. All right, let's start over here with this team. When you're ready. Can you turn on the other light? Mm -hmm. Uh, we're the green team. I've been observing the witness heat number two. My, also, uh, my observation subject is uh, pretty sort push. I was doing the witness heat number one. Mine was over to you number four. And we just taught a lesson on phenophases and observations and how knowing the different phenophases of plants can help you make better observations. And what we learned is from uh, is to uh, whenever the whenever to do observer observe or no new lab, new knowledge new knowledge and um, we both need to do uh, we both need to um uh, do hands on and summarize the useful way. Um, I learned that um, citizen science and technology and their connections, um, their applications to our daily lives, and our um, methods of doing observations and how to um, apply them to citizen science. Um, I learned that technology is not only for plants but animals too. Um, I learned that I actually find plant science and their life cycles more interesting than I originally thought. All right, super. Thanks, Gracie. Next team, please. For the plants and subshops team, and over the last few weeks, I've been observing the scarlet glow mallow tree. Uh, I've been observing the uh, scarlet glow mallow number one. Uh, I've been observing the cassia, the cassia. And we recently gave like a 10 minute uh, lesson plan about the different type of phenol phases and how they're important. Their importance, and uh, we access we assess the class through like a fun mini quiz. And what I learned through this uh, lesson plan and stuff like that was the importance of phenophases, not just for us, but like gardeners, farmers, the animals themselves, and stuff like that. Uh, what I've learned from this project is actually how to utilize my free time in order to help the uh, uh, the community and the scientific projects, such as the uh, Nature's Notebook, where I can in my free time just do a good observation of a plant that's nearby me and actually help the community. Um, from the past few weeks, from the learning of the observation, so uh, I learned how to observe the plants with the National Notebook and now the Venus, uh, Venus, 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 
I'm the citizen science, so I enjoy that. Great. Thank you, team. For succulents, you're up. <laughs> so I'm the super succulent, and I observe Akira number two and three. Uh, I've been observing Jojoba number two. And I have been observing Jojoba two number four. I observe Jojoba two one and Jojoba one. Uh, something interesting I learned is that acacias attract hummingbirds. Uh, I learned that citizen science, what it is, and that we can actually use it even as students to help the development of like real scientific studies. And uh, I learned how to uh, do the tradition using the, the five cents. I learned more about preservation, which was uh, preserved plants and their uses, which we discussed uh, the past and present uses of desert plants. I learned that um, the sea flower has more protein than uh, wheat flour. And our presentation on desert plants and their uses, past and present, and ecology. And we got in some plants around campus and that you can find nearby and some things that they're fun to Great, thank you. I went to campus in Parker. I'm Jesse. I'm also really one of the celebrity mates, Sam, because uh, no, she's out of the sense. So um, my friends, hey, Sam. And the sense of observation is Kenzie Barrett-Hunters, the one which is located on the north boundary of the front garden. Uh, I observe the, the candy bird barrel cactus, uh, which is located in the left of Park Garden. And I observe um, the severe cactus. And then our lesson plan that we um, presented in front of our class, we used the ABC objectives um, while presenting the subject of how to use the nature to look at. And so the ABC the objectives our audience, behavior, conditions, and degree. And our audience was, we asked our um, class if they could act. Um, sorry. <laughs> we asked our um, class if they could pretend to be um, just regular U-based students, um, pretending they don't know what the nature of the notebook app is or what phonology is. And then, um, the behavior, well, the goal of the presentation is that they know what the Nature's Notebook app is and that they'll be able to access it. And then um, the conditions um, uh, are, um, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> right now. Um, the condition is where you using uh, some teaching method like role play and video games and playing games to let students to get more and more results. And the degree is that we provided a cookie at the end, which is a game like that provides questions and they um, pick an answer to that kind of shows their knowledge after the presentation that they learn. Um, what? Yeah, so I learned what the term phenology even is. Um, it's basically the study of the life cycles and season, seasonal changes um, in relation to animals and plants. So I learned about I learned a lot about our um, plant with the figural cactus and candy barrel cactus. Um, actually, I'm from China and I haven't seen so large cactus in my home. So I'm curious about that, and I said some information about the um, cactus on the internet. For example, I learned that um, the, um, the arms of Sidro uh, is uh, its role to increase the reproductive cactus uh, capacity. Yeah, it's major. And what I learned is it is a scientist program. Citizen Scientist is a service learning pro project that uh, involves Nature's Notebook. And uh, through this project, a student will learn how to uh, will learn different techniques about learning and teaching, such as uh, uh, collect data research and uh, using social media write-ups and uh, 
and uh, reflection on reflection to a national database. Great amount of learning. Thank you so much. Last team, you're up. Matt, 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 we did a lot of um, observations about development of the and we present our research in the presentation. So, so the main goal of our lesson was to use both our research that we gained through articles and online searches, as well as our um, observations that we made. Uh, we use that to help uh, teach the students about some important facts about the development um, of the um, uh, uh, I learned about uh, how important the Dublin uh, Muskie is, and it's, um, it is like you can produce a lot of food, and uh, it's basically, uh, yeah, it's, it is basically a different about being a base in citizen science and just how important phenophases you know, phases are to us uh, and the wildlife around and how our observations are important to uh, bigger findings. So what I learned is that um, Citizen Science in, uh, in particular Nature's Notebook does a good job at, very job at helping increase retention um, with what you're learning about the different plants and phenophases. Um, and it's also very cool that it, you're also at the same time helping scientists uh, gather meaningful data. So. Great, that's thrilling. <laughs> that impresses me. Thank you guys so much. Um, it really is a good indicator of um, what you've taken away from the class so far, which is excellent. Going back to the quiz, we have almost done here. So early in the semester, we do some team building, which is an important learning outcome. We did a marshmallow challenge, and that's obviously carried through. Um, to their project. So working together is a really important outcome, and I thought it would be fun to remind us that we did that in day one as we're getting to know each other. All right, so um, some engagement examples. We're going to watch a couple videos that are 10 seconds, and then we're going to look at some photos that students participated in the Pheno Week, National Phenology Week that happened recently. Hi there, my name is Samantha Arrington and I oh, observe and collect data on cactus in Tucson, Arizona at my PBS station in Texas. Awesome. This is for the crowd and cloud call out for PBS videos. Students got some extra credit and had some fun engaging with this. Hi, I'm Megan Pistons. I'm a PhD in one of the classes master. I participated in citizen science and I also observed some data and my nature's not Great. And so we're hoping that these, along with my online students' videos, will be um, on a PBS channel this coming Sunday. So I will let you know so that you can go watch. And then other students got involved with the hashtag you know, Week 2016 challenge, where we did a little mini field trip out to the garden uh, one day a few weeks ago. And then uh, students posted on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the hashtag you know, Week 2016 to call out their observations. So again, thank you the entire class for participating in this project this term, especially since we're still pretty new into our service learning partnership with Nature's Notebook. And we've had some fun in this term doing some extra things, meeting our community partners' needs along the way. Great, and that's it for us. Oh, that was so great. Thank you, Lisa, so much to you and your class for doing all that. Um, that was just a really wonderful overview of how you are using Nature's Notebook in the classroom and then what the students got out of it. I think it really goes to show that even in a short time, like a semester, there's a lot of information that you can process and use and feel really good about it. So I love all those videos, too. We'll put them on the website for sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much.
And if, are you able to hang out a little while, Lisa, in case anybody has any questions? Yes, we can. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to switch it over to Stephen now, um, and then we can come on back and ask, uh, ask if anybody has any questions. Let's see. All right, hang on one second. Why can't I find him in the list to make him presenter? He should be a presenter. Okay, Stephen, you should be all set. So see if okay. you can um, pop up yeah. your PowerPoint. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see the PowerPoint. Do you? We do not. So see if there's that button that says show main screen. Is that the shared one? Uh, okay, make okay. I don't see my name though. I can see Lisa and Sharon. Yeah, you are listed as a presenter. Let's see. Okay. Am I there? Um, try to make him presenter again. It's going away. Hang on. I mean, it's still on my screen. I don't know why it's not on yours, so I'm kind of surprised. But all right, let me see. If I can't get it to share yours, then I will just share it on mine because you sent it to me. Yeah, we had it a few seconds ago. All right, try one more time. Show my Are screen. You got a pop-up that says. Yeah, I did. I clicked on there it. We go. Now we see it. Okay, uh, I didn't click on it last time. I'm sorry. There we go. Cool. Take it away. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for sharing the stories about Arizona. That was kind of fun to hear. And all the cacti studies. Uh, I'm in Minnesota, and if you can see the sort of the top screen, um, we're November 1st, and it feels like almost uh, October 1st. So it's very strange weather we're having here day after Halloween. Uh, what I did is uh, presented uh, this at the conference last week at the North American Association for Environmental Ed, and and um, so I've sort of modified this kind of showing what we're doing here in Minnesota, and hopefully uh, uh, give you some insights on how we're using Nature's Notebook. So uh, first off, let's see, uh, make it move here. Um, just the other day, I was looking out my window. I don't know if you can see my second slide. Does that make sense? And um, that's what my backyard looked like, which was kind of surprising because it was near the end of October. But I use this to show all the different phenophases that you can sort of see just in your backyard, like um, flowers and fruits and nuts and then um, obviously the trees and there are some birds at the feeders. So just a variety of uh, phenophases that you can start to see in, along with a rug hanging on the line. Um, in your backyard. And uh, so once you sort of become obsessed with looking for phenophases, if it's cactus or uh, birds nesting or migration, we're kind of in the peak of, of, um, of the geese and the duck migration. Most of the songbirds have gone. So, um, but they're out there every day when you're out walking around, you can hear um, all these phenophases going on if you just start to look. Anyways, the key of the talk was sort of looking at how phenology provides widespread and coherent signals of climate change. So these are sort of standard designs for what we know about climate change, sort of what the stories they are. But in Minnesota, and especially if you're in Arizona and you're from out of the country, you may not realize that Minnesota, this is a national picture right here. You can see where we sit and we have three biomes, three major biomes. We have a prairie biome that comes in from the west. That's what you see in yellow. And then you see that darker green biome. That's the that's that north, or that's the big woods broadleaf forest. Um, and that is kind of going all the way to the east coast. So that's, you know, the big forest of the east coast. And that goes right through the middle of Minnesota, sort of at a 45 degree angle. And then we have the boreal forest, which is conifers, um, and pines, and that really is the north 
east corner of the state. So even across the, the northern part of the state, which we're on the Canadian border, so from Arizona, we're on the other end of the continent, right dead in the middle. In fact, the um, the temperature and the moisture apex in North America is right in the middle of our um, broadleaf board, uh, woodland forest. So um, it's kind of almost in the sort of upper Midwest, right around here in Minnesota, if you can see my little squizzly. So that's in North America. So what we're looking at in terms of this, this these biomes, these three major biomes, is to see how those shift over the next 50 years. And so that's really why we're, we're kind of pushing uh, Nature's Notebook in Minnesota. And this is Minnesota's average temperature uh, when we look at the last 100 years. And you can see some trends. Um, but when you're looking at a yearly trends, um, you can see up on the up today in the in in 2000 and 2010 2015 you can start to see it looks like it's warming but really when we start to look at minnesota's um, temperature it's by far more interesting to look at the seasons so we look at the december january february winter spring is march april may and then j summer is june july and august and fall is um, september october november and What's key on all of this, when you start to break this apart, is it's got a different pattern than what we're sort of used to. But what's interesting is that it's the shoulders of each of these seasons that look like they're changing. So it's not sort of the middle of spring, not sort of the middle of winter or the middle of summer, but we see it on the shoulders of each of our seasons. And I think that can be kind of the interesting part of looking at um, climate and then looking at um, just what's going on with phenology. So we're going to see how that plays out when we get down through our slides. Um, essence, what that shows is that when we look at the next 50 years, um, well, maybe a little more than 50 years, but um, we're looking at the next 80 years that Minnesota is really moving south and sort of east. That means those three biomes that you saw in Minnesota are going to look different. We don't know how they're going to look. We, ha we can only speculate what those options are. But by hopefully collecting data and getting enough observers out there, we can start to see some of these trends. And that's kind of what we're trying to do in Minnesota is, is uh, bring those observers together and, and um, sh you know, do the, the citizen science work that can help do that. So what have we learned so far is um, this year, if we look at the growing season length from our phenophase stages, we're seeing very significant differences in terms of the length of the growing seasons. This year alone, and um, we just heard, I heard just this morning that October was four degrees warmer than any other time in, in uh, recorded history. And that was recorded, um, I mean, that just closed yesterday. We're looking at um, two weeks longer growing season than average. So in essence, we're adding a week to both ends of our um, frost seasons in Minnesota. Um, also, we're seeing a different uh, pest outbreaks that play a role in um, agriculture and uh, natural resources. Um, Pollinators are huge in the state, um, both the butterfly, we've got major efforts working with uh, observing and following monarchs, and then all the bees. And um, bees have become extremely uh, important, especially for agriculture, and so we're, we're doing a fair amount of work on trying to, to use citizen science to follow and monitor both butterflies and bees. Um, again, we're looking again at the middle of the continent, and here you can start to see Minnesota is kind of at the apex of some of the allergy issues. So these things are increasing uh, in this part of, of the region. So we're kind of, it's decreasing in Texas, but it's increasing in, in, um, in the northern part of the continent, right dead center. And then Canada, it's even worse. Uh, management decisions can be used to help um, 
natural resources. But if we look at this historically, we know that um, when the shad bush or the Juneberry bloom, that's when the shad were coming up river. That's when you could capture or, or, or manage the fish. Uh, when the oak leaf is the size of the either the paws of the the squirrel or the ear of the squirrel, that's when you plant corn. So thinking of how management plays a role uh, based on phenology. Uh, two years ago, actually two, three years ago, um, we had a really early spring and the maple bush, which maple syrup comes from maple trees, and um, essentially what we do in, in Minnesota, northern Minnesota and Wisconsin and uh, on the east coast and in Canada is we, we collect the sap and then we boil it down, that's how we get maple syrup. And uh, there was no maple run that year because it warmed up really fast and then we had a spring, after, you know, then we had a frost after that and we lost the apple crop. Um, so that was in 2012, um, the apple crop in Minnesota and Wisconsin and parts of Michigan were lost along with a cherry crop. Uh, this spring we lost the grape crop because we had an early spring and then we had a frost in early May and so we lost our our grape crop. Um, and then um, just this whole area of connecting with nature and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the backyard phenology but that is a project where we're just working on trying to engage um, audiences with this whole area of, of um, nature in your community. So one of the things that has gone on the last year or so is uh, I work with faculty at the university here in forestry named Rebecca Montgomery and uh, we're collecting data across the state on anyone who knows anything about phenology, who's recorded phenological data uh, in the last 20 years, 20 plus years. And so some of this is from, you know, your uncle, your grandfather, um, you know, who's a farmer who might be recording when the birds come or uh, when I can get out in the field or maybe um, ice out in the lake so that you can go fishing or whatever. But what we have now, uh, as of now, is we have uh, over, 30, over 45 studies with birds. We have 41 on butterflies. Big, uh, again, that's a big hit in this state. And then over 140 uh, observers and on plants that have collected data for over 20 plus years. And we're in the process of digitizing this data and I'll share some of the things we've learned from um, from this data. Um, and some of it is, you know, basically on the back of, of an envelope type of thing or they're in a calendar or whatever, but we've been able to collect some of this data and um, digitize it. This is kind of a picture of some of these phenologists who have recorded data in the last 20 plus years and, how, and now we're, we're trying to digitize this so it's available to, to the public. Um, some of this data looks like this and so we're having to convert it into uh, digitized data so that we can use it. Larry Weber, who, um, just go back here, Larry Weber is down in the right hand corner down here in the blue t-shirt. Uh, he has, uh, if you look across the top, for the last 2,000, excuse me, 24,635, 24, and then on the right side, 24,636 days, he has been collecting uh, phenological data in his farm and his land um, up near Duluth, Minnesota. So you get an idea of the data that he's collected. And Larry has also written a number of books on phenology and uh, insects and plants and spiders and fungus and stuff like this. Okay, so those are some of the things we're trying to do in the state. We're trying to get that data digitized and then uh, trying to get folks motivated to you know, do Nature's Notebook and get out and collect data. Uh, we're also working with students and uh, we have worked with a program called uh, driven to discover, we call it D2D, and they have put together using Nature's Notebook um, a curriculum that we're working with teachers on, and they get to apply that with uh, in the classroom, and it goes, it sort of it follows, it does follow the national science standards. So it's, it's a nice little circle here where it's you observe and wonder, you question, 
you develop a question, you develop a hypothesis, test it, analyze, interpret, conclude, and then you know that's kind of standard little circle of science. Um, we're focusing on this project, really looking at observing and wonder, similar to what I heard what was going on in Arizona, getting out and watching and looking. We start with a wonder board. Um, we go out on short little hikes and little um, sheets of paper, post-it notes. We uh, list our wonders and we post them on the wall and we start to kind of group them together. And then uh, with that, we help develop um, kind of sort of sort of some questions, so we develop testable questions and um, help the students become the scientists, uh, help them develop a hypothesis, plan and test um, to confirm their um, or contradict their hypothesis, analyze the data, and then write a report. Um, this sort of follows the sort of the traditional model of claim, evidence, reasoning, and rebuttal. And um, what we really do, though, with our program, so we we talk about you know claim and evidence, and then reasoning. We sort of uh, pop this around. We ch change that. We really start to look at recording what you see. That's that phenological perspective that. Um, we, I heard it over in, in the Arizona presentations, and also it's kind of standard of what we're doing with phenology is getting folks out there to observe, make questions, and then from that you build the, um, the claim. So the evidence is first, that's what you're doing with your phenology, you're basically forcing, you know, asking people to, to uh, observe, and uh, then from that they, they think about claims, what is going on, and then try to figure out what the reason is. So what that looks like, it might play out like this, where you observe birds in the early morning and afternoon over five days. On average, you see six kinds of birds in the morning and three kinds in the afternoon. So you claim, that go to the second column, more species of birds are active in the morning than in the afternoon. And then you start to figure out your reasoning. So now you're putting your study together. Insects that many birds eat tend to be more active in the morning or birds of prey are more active in the afternoon, whatever. You're starting to then find a way to test your, um, your claim. So that curriculum is available and I can send responses on that too to teachers or folks who are interested. Um, again, it follows um, in, you know, the Nature's Notebook um, protocols. Uh, the other thing that we're trying to do in Minnesota is not try to cover the waterfront, but pick a few species that we're hoping everyone can follow over time. Um, obviously, people have their favorites, but these are kind of standard species, and that's one of the focuses that, uh, so we have seven species. We're looking at the monarch, the loon, the tamarack. Um, the, the hummingbird, the red maple, bluebirds, um, and lilacs. And those are species that we're hoping um, folks follow. They may follow, um, you know, aspen and poplar or, um, you know, oaks. There's a lot of other species that they may choose to, um, to track. Uh, the other piece is just thinking about how we use that data, so sort of using the data visual visualization tools that are available um, on uh, Nature's Notebook, so getting, you know, getting the youth and getting the participants engaged using that, that those data. So we're looking here at Tamarack breaking needle buds uh, from two years. The first one is 2012. Remember, that was the year I told you about um, the early... Uh, the early spring, so that comes through pretty clear, and then in 2015, so that was last year, which is more typical, and it it sort of shows the difference in how early that was. Then we looked at the needle drop from 2012 and 2013, and again, it seems to um, be coherent in terms of the number of days both of them are reflected on that. So you could sort of look at how you would use visualization tools, and I think that's important in terms of the um, students using our data. Okay, for the next few minutes, I'll just talk about outcomes that are, are popping through for Minnesota, and you maybe get a little feel from that. You know, those 20 plus years of data collection uh, with a number of, we had 41 looking at butterflies. Um, this is one fellow that uh, has been studying the, the uh, eastern tail blue and, and we see this really cool pattern that's happening. So in other words, um, the butterfly is returning earlier each year. 
And when we look at the Sandhill Crane, again, this is from our, our data, historical data. Um, we are again seeing that uh, increase or deep, you know, earlier arrival of the Sandhill Crane each year. And again, this is, uh, we're looking at uh, some major changes here that this, you know, we really didn't have access to this data before we could get into the long-term data um, observations. So yellow, wump, yellow rumped warbler, again, starting back in the 1980s going to 2015, and that appears to be moving earlier each year. Um, Baltimore Oriole, it's pretty random, so we're not seeing any uh, downward trends there. When we start to figure out the question, why is the yellow rump coming back earlier and the Baltimore um, Oriole coming pretty much around the same time, and we start to see uh, that where they winter and breed is pretty different, and so uh, one is where it's warming up, and the other one is probably controlled by sun. Um, this is kind of where it, it started, this sort of body of literature that really started in the 1940s. Um, Hodson from the entomology department on campus would walk to work every day and he would observe a uh, leaf out of aspens and he just kept recording that each year uh, from 1940 to 1990 when he passed. Um, and we again picked it up in 2010. Uh, we were kind of curious, uh, John Latimer from uh, Grand Rapids was also collecting data on, on Aspen up in uh, Grand Rapids and we then kind of joined the two uh, databases together and we're starting to see this really cool trend where Aspen definitely are, are, are blooming from 1940 to 215, about two weeks earlier, and uh, which seems to be pretty significant. Um, along with some of that other data, we also had this pop through from uh, the researchers looking at red maple, and we saw a really interesting pattern, and it's kind of going the other direction, which says, wait a minute, maybe we should, you know, uh, question this idea of climate and this climate variability questions. So we started to look a little closer and, and found out that red maple are sensitive to winter chill days. And so in other words, a number of days below zero it actually increase the likelihood that it'll, it'll uh, break earlier. Again, it was something we're, we're not so much aware of here in Minnesota, but we did find that Canadians had already researched that and, and documented that. Um, we looked at some earlier studies to discover that the blueberry, this blueberry on the right, this blueberry plant, there's, it was split in half. This was, I think, done in 1925 or 1920. And what happened is uh, if you were to ask the question, which half bloomed, one half was inside the greenhouse, the other half was outside the greenhouse. And the half that was inside the greenhouse, which is on the left, did not bloom. The half that was on the right was outside, and lo and behold, it bloomed. So cold sensitive. It needs cold in order for blueberries to, um, to bloom and to, to grow. Another kind of interesting study that was done, because this kind of looks at where do we get, you know, this question of, of using phenology and looking at phosphorus in our lakes. We have a number of lakes in the metro area here, excuse me, and we, you can see where um, when the leaves fall, the, drain, the leaves go down the drain, and then it goes and it impacts a lot of our bodies of water. So we really have been looking at how can we sort of use phenology to better understand uh, and save money for our municipalities. And so what we've done is a couple of studies. You can see way on the right here on the bottom, we've done leaf studies where we're looking at on uh, the impact that leaves have and how they decompose and the number, of the, the amount of phosphorus that is in those leaves and basically looking at how that gets down into our streams and into our, our lakes. Um, and we did find that um, Norway maples really were one of the major culprits. Uh, so we worked with, uh, we did a study where we actually looked at how a community and municipality could save money if they ran the street sweepers at the right time and captured the leaves right after they fell, especially those who created a lot of phosphorus in the streams. 
are in those streams and in the lakes. So this is kind of the this is the study showing the seasonal snor, uh, storm water, matching it with the tree phenology. So leaf out, and also leaf drop, and you can see this really um, increase in phosphorus in the streams. Uh, in the late fall, no, October, and November, as the leaves are dropping, and then after the leaves, you know, have disappeared again, it goes back to kind of a, a, a sort of standard late in December. So it's kind of interesting to see that printout. We all so the idea of saving money because the cost of phosphorus removal of phosphorus out of our lakes is outrageous because our lakes are, you know, eutrophicating really quickly. Another study that just was shown in um, Nature's Notebook was the, the mayfly studies and trying to inform municipalities on how to protect the communities and clean up for from the mayfly um, outbreaks and we have mayflies in both Minnesota and Wisconsin so those studies again s help save money for the municipalities. Um, a, kind of a fun project that's working on that Rebecca Montgomery is working on is called Be Forewarmed and we're looking at increasing um, temperatures in um, plots uh, in Minnesota, several places in Minnesota where we're doing prairies and, and forests, and then just seeing um, how that can, so we're predicting how um, the, the forest and, the, and the, the plant communities will change with increased temperatures. So we have these heaters, and then we have uh, heaters in the ground, and we're raising it basically for four degrees Celsius, not quite, 3.7 degrees Celsius. And what we're looking at is ambient, uh, and 3.6, I should say. Uh, and we're looking at open canopy and closed canopy, um, and when you see the buds not broken or, or buds um, not broken, that means in the closed canopy, that's sort of the standard. And then when we look at the, um, the treatment area, 3.6, we're starting to see that the buds are breaking um, obviously before, this is uh, April 27th, so we're going to go through this quickly here. Um, we're looking at May 4th, same plant, uh, again in, this, in the ambient where it's sort of our control group, and then um, uh, in the treatment group 3.6, you can see the leaves are definitely uh, out. Um, and then May 11th, so that was May 4th. Again, they're just starting. The bud break is right up above, and now we have full leaves um, in the 3.6 um, space. Uh, May 18th, the leaves are full again in the um, treatment area, and they're just starting to come out. Uh, so we're seeing an extension, and if you look at the blue on each of these, so we have um, popple and uh, birch and maples and oaks. And if you start to look at the sort of the ambient, that was the blue, and then, then you look at the, the treatment, you can see there's several more weeks of um, growth that our plants are having. So 9 to 17 days longer um, that you're seeing with the increased temperature in that. Again, our goal is to increase the 1,000 statewide network observers in plants and animals. Um, one last piece is we're also trying to develop a program with nature centers and schools and get them uh, involved in sort of a nature center phenology trails. Uh, we're using Nature's Notebook to help uh, guide that. Uh, Beltman Nature Center has already developed one, and so we're, we're using that sort of as a model and what it should look like. And then um, you heard about backyard phenology. We have this little scamp that we run around to events, and inside the scamp we have a recording studio, and we invite people to uh, tell us about what what they have observed in nature over their lifetime, and what do they think the theory of change is, and how does change happen. So those are the three questions that we typically will ask, and then we record that in the studio uh, with observers as they they tell us those stories, and then uh, we document that and share that. Uh, thought I'd just end with this little change here in our northern forests. Okay, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think that's great. There's so many applications that you highlighted in your presentation that um, are so 
engaging and on different levels because you're engaging the scientist community, you're engaging the school groups and students and um, volunteers. And I really love that airstream that you have, you guys have where you take it and you get people talking about some of these phenological changes that they've noticed during their well, lifetime. Well, not quite an airstream. I called it a scamp. A scamp? <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, because an airstream would be like Are nobody. Are big ones? That. It's that really tiny little guy. Yeah. yeah. An airstream is quite big. <laughs> nice. And you take quite it to farmer markets and things TV. too, right? Yeah. Is that where? Yep. That's such a great idea. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to take the last couple minutes and open it up to our audience. It looks like we still have some people hanging on, so that's great. Um, if anybody has any questions, I can go ahead and unmute the uh, attendees, and then we can just see if folks want to ask a question. Let's see. I can unmute everybody. Or you can t type it into the chat box oh, if you have a question. That's a great pen. Uh, and what's the other two? Heidi? Oh, Let's see. All right, I'm unmuting everybody individually. Probably not a great idea. I guess we're going to get a lot of feedback. People are talking, so. Okay. Yeah. So how about if you guys just chat in any questions you might have? Okay, I waited a, a you know reasonable amount of time to see if anybody would chat any questions, and I guess nobody's got any at this particular time. But I wanted to thank both Lisa and Stephen for presenting their information to us. Lisa says she's going to post all of the content on the website, so we can put it up on our our website for you guys if you wanted to see the Prezi that she made. Um, and I think probably both of them would be glad to make their contact information available. Um, it looks like maybe Josh is raising his hand. So Josh, I'm gonna unmute you if you have a question. Can you hear me, Josh? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Um, I just uh, had a question. Um, how do students use their personal data when you're using uh, phenology observations within just one year? So I guess, uh, this would be more for, um, uh, sorry, was it Lisa? Uh-huh. Yeah, for Lisa So you want to know so how they use their data. Yep. Correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually phenology, you're looking at trends over decades, but um, if you're trying to get incorporate student data from just one season or one week or one year, how does that work? Okay. I'm going to mute you again, and then I'm going to unmute Lisa so she can answer. Lisa, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Did you hear Josh's question? I did, actually that's the one that I was gonna um, try to answer earlier, so I'm glad that, that this worked out. Um, yeah, it, it can be a challenge for students, but they can look through the Nature's Notebook app, of course, at the visualization tool and see past data and compare their current data to past data. I also, I just did a midterm poll with them to see how the project was going. And one of the questions I ask is, will you actually, do you think you might be involved with Nature's Notebook throughout the year? So if I'm only capturing you for spring, summer, or fall, um, has this raised your interest level? Or perhaps you'll go home over the holidays and keep recording data. And so my hope is that we'll grab students that want to keep reporting data as they're here at the University of Arizona. But certainly for this particular class, they can go ahead and analyze past data from other students or other local phenology networks. And we have 
uh, what, almost 30 phenology trails here in the Tucson area. And so they can look at local data and compare just their one term um, data. But it, it can be a challenge, but my hope is that this will raise their exposure level and then hopefully um, a portion of them will just keep, keep going as they're here at the University of Arizona and then carry nature's notebook back to wherever they're from. I think that answers the question. <laughs> Yes, I think it does. Thank you so much. Because I know you also had them kind of looking at what they were recording through time and um, comparing it to some of the other information that was already in Nature's Notebook as well. So. Correct. Yeah, and then like you and I have talked about, because I teach in the summer, it's a unique opportunity for us to gather student data over the summer, albeit a small sample size at least we're getting some more consistent data over time where there were gaps in our data because our students generally leave. And so the biggest data you're getting from some of our natural resource students or ecology students is from spring and, and fall. And so we're giving back a little bit by having our summer, summer students add to that data collection pool as well. 